Well, good morning. It's good to see you all and uh, for us to be gathered here for worship today. We'd like to take a moment to lift up a few announcements. In your bulletin, you'll notice a couple of different inserts about Bible studies that are coming up. There's the, the study on Hosea and the study on Galatians that will be taking place. And I encourage you to check those out. And uh, there will be a, a great studies. I know that there will be a lot that you'll enjoy getting out of those. So just encourage you to, to take note of those. Um, also, in your, your uh, calendar for the week, you'll notice that our youth are going to be participating in retreat this coming uh, weekend. That'll be the 18th through the 21st. We want to encourage, uh, well, our, our youth are already signed up, so, but uh, we want to ask that you just hold them in prayer as they uh, go on this retreat. It's going to be a great weekend, and uh, we just pray blessings upon them as they go. And then beginning on the uh, 30th, we'll have our confirmation class that'll be begin uh, be from 5 to 6 o'clock in uh, the second floor in the confirmation room and the education wing. I'll be teaching that and working with our 5th and 6th graders and, in fact, any of the kids who, even if they might be a little bit older, uh, who've not gone through confirmation and want to participate in that, we'll encourage them to do so. Uh, those are our announcements for the week. We want to take a, a, just a moment to move from the, the announcements and activities and things that we have going on to really letting ourselves be present for this moment. Uh, we set aside this hour to do the most important task that we do, and that is to bring worship to God, to open our hearts and minds, to set ourselves before the living God so that he might guide and direct us for the coming week. So let us now begin the service of worship by uh, opening ourselves to Christ's presence in our lives. Hello, everyone. If everyone would please stand and join me singing our hymn of praise, It Is Well With My Soul.
remain standing for our call to worship this morning. Come to the fountain of life. Come to the streams of mercy. Come, dip in the reservoir of forgiveness. Come by renewed by the eternal springs. Be filled with overflowing blessings. Come walk beside still waters. Be empowered by the rivers of justice. Come all you yearning for meaning, hoping for truth, thirsting for God. Here in the power of spirit, find your thirst quenched and your joy expanded. If you would take a minute to greet those around you in the name of Christian love. Make your way back to your seats. We're going to do our songs of praise and worship.
not soup at all. It's water in a bowl, but since it's in the church, this water means much more. We're talking about the baptismal font on this episode of Chuck Knows Church. Now, you, now may you may have, have noticed the bowl, bowl on a stand near the front of your church, church stand about yay high, high comes, comes in various sizes and styles depending, depending on your church or denomination. denomination. And, and despite, despite what your big brother, brother might have told you to get you in trouble, trouble when you were a kid, it, it is, is not, not a place to wash your hands before attending worship. worship. It's, it's the baptismal font. font. And uh, uh, this, this font is way cooler than the Helvetic Four Times in Roman. Now, now, some, some baptismal fonts are even large, large enough for your whole body. body. Now, that's, that's called, called full immersion. And, and again, despite what your brother might have said, those, those are not for hot tubbing. tubbing. Now, now, in the United, United Methodist, Methodist Church, Church, most, most are small, like, like this, this one, for the sprinkling, sprinkling of water onto infants and adults. Now, now, Baptism initiates us into Christ's Holy Church. Church. And in the United Methodist Church, it's one of two sacraments, the other being Holy Communion. Now, before you ask, I said sacrament, not sacrament. This has nothing to do with combating bad breath. Now, sacrament is God's offer of grace to us and our vow of commitment in response. You see, we receive our identity from others, from the expectations and influences of friends and family, from the labels that society puts on us. But, but to become a Christian is to receive, receive a new identity. Now we, we no longer uh, allow others to tell us who we are. Christ, Christ now claims us. Now another way of saying, saying it is we put, put on Christ, Christ uh, which, which works, works out nice because he's a pretty good, good fit. Now, now baptism celebrates becoming that new person. person. That's, That's why, why the church's ritual, ritual begins with, with putting off the old by renouncing sin, sin and, and the evil powers of the world and, and pledging our loyalty to Christ. So the, so the most, most important, important thing about, about us is, is our true identity, identity and, and we, we are now sons and daughters, and daughters of God. God. We, are we are incorporated in God's, in God's mighty act of salvation, salvation and given new birth through water, water and the Spirit. Spirit. Now that, that is the baptism of Uh If you want to learn more, more you can ask your pastor. pastor. Uh, tell the judge to you. As Steve had mentioned last week, uh, there are over 100 videos if you go to Chuck Nose Church about different things from uh, acolytes to uh, why it's called a North X. Uh, the church I grew up in, uh, it was on the north end of the building, and it was where you went out. And so I always thought it was the north exit. I thought that's what it, it stood for. Uh, and, but it's, it's, it's spelled differently, I realized. And, uh, but there, there are all kinds of videos there that can uh, let you know about different things about the church. And, uh, and it's a fun place just to spend a, uh, if you waste a little time on the Internet if you're out there. As we uh, come now to our time of, of prayer, we'd like to lift up those prayer concerns that we have on the, uh, the back of the bulletin. Um, we, we want to hold each of these people in our prayers. We want to also share with you that if there's someone that you would like to have added to our prayer concern list, that you can uh, write their name down on a piece of paper, put in the offering plate, and as the collection is taken, then uh, those names will be added to our, our prayer concern list as well. Um, we want to, to just hold each of these uh, families and uh, individuals in our prayers along with the individual prayers of our hearts and lives today. Let us prepare ourselves now for our time of prayer. O holy God, your spirit lifts us like the melody of a song, and you comfort us with a parent's warm embrace. Like the mother eagle who shelters her young, you are there to care for us, and to hold off persistent doubts and painful memories and past. Your love gives us strength so that we might make commitments in our lives that, are, that last and that we can live faithfully even when we do not see the evidence around us. 
Oh God, you seek us out with a loving heart. You call us by name. You open your arms to welcome us. You are always desiring to be in a relationship with us. Even when we've walked away, you have remained persistent and steadfast. We are humbled by your constant love for us as we walk in amazement of your forgiveness. Today, as we remember our baptism, we remember that you have welcomed us into this family. We give thanks to you for your grace, for your forgiveness, that you have washed us clean. And we pray that we might follow faithfully in the footsteps of Jesus. We pray that you would be at work in the lives of individuals, bringing about healing where there is brokenness, bringing about healing to the places of, of illness, that you would help us to, to be united with one another, that your presence would give us assurance to those who are despairing. We ask for your wondrous and generous grace and guidance in our lives. To those who are behind bars, we pray that your will will be made known. We pray for a lessening of hatred and fear in this world and that you would guide us one more step closer to bringing your kingdom to bear in this world. God, we pray for your church, for a, a generous sense of grace and a large measure of guidance. We ask for your blessing and guidance in our lives this coming week. We pray this to you in the strong name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 and 21 through 22. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Got the right one. I, I, I pulled out the notes from last week's sermon. I was like, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. <laughs> then, I, then I just kind of about freaked out. It's like, oh, is it back in my office? Am I going to have to run back to the office and get that? Or, oh, maybe I left it at the, the, on the table beside my chair at home, you know. Uh, give me about 15 minutes and I'll be back. <laughs> Goodness. I, you know, maybe I'm starting to get to that age. I'm not sure. I am? Okay. All right. <laughs> you're, yeah, you are, but not by much, not by much, Steve. But we, uh, 
you know, we come through the Christmas or the Christmas season at a uh, busy time, but always lots of fun and deep and, and full of meaning. Uh, you know, we always have that little bit of tension where in the church, uh, we're trying to hold off too much of the celebration uh, before we actually get to Christmas Day uh, because then we have 12 days to celebrate it until uh, the, the Magi come, and uh, we celebrated that last week. And, um, you know, when you read the Gospels, there um, are not a lot of stories about Jesus' life prior to uh, his, his ministry at 30 years old. In fact, if you start the Gospel of uh, of Mark, it starts at that point. It doesn't tell any of the stories of Jesus' birth or uh, during his childhood. Uh, John gives us a theological understanding and framework around uh, Jesus' coming, but it's not the, the, uh, the narrative that we get from Luke and Matthew about Jesus' birth. Um, but even there, we quickly jump to, to Jesus' ministry. Um, there's a, a fascinating uh, gospel that was written a couple hundred years later. It's not, it was a, called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. And it's called the Infancy Gospel because, um, you know, they took, I think, some liberty to just kind of speculate about what Jesus' childhood might have been like. And they re- wrote a lot of stories that, that, uh, that come out of there, uh, some that are just kind of fun, like his... Uh, father who's a carpenter. Um, One day he has a board that he's trying to build something with and he's cut it too short and so Jesus tells his dad you grab a hold of that end and he grabs a hold of the other and he pulls it and stretches it so the board's long enough. Um, You know it's kind of the there's some interesting stories like that. There's one that's just terrifying that that as a child he got mad and had a tantrum and uh, killed his friend who he was playing with before he then raised him from the dead. Uh, you, know, there, you know, there's good reason why we didn't include it in our Bible, right? But, um, but we wonder, you know, some about that period. Um, in the life of the church, we move from Epiphany, celebrating uh, that part of Jesus' childhood, to immediately uh, his baptism, because it's his baptism that begins his earthly ministry. And all of the Gospels include uh, that as the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He uh, goes to John. Many are wondering if John is the Messiah. And so uh, there's all kinds of speculation about John. And um, Jesus arrives there, and John immediately recognizes that he is the one. Uh, God's guidance, God's wisdom in his life, uh, the intervention of the Holy Spirit to, to be able to see and to understand. And so he sees in Jesus the one who has come to make all things right. And Jesus uh, comes before John for baptism. And so we remember this as the baptism of our Lord Sunday. Coming at the beginning of the calendar year, It also is a good time for us to, as we think about the coming year, to renew our sense of of baptism. One of the things we're going to do in the service as we uh, move forward, and this will be at the close of the service, is we'll invite you to come up and to uh, have in the baptismal font, we have water that's there, and to dip your fingers in the water and to touch your forehead with the water. You might want to make the sign of the cross, maybe just to touch and to remember. Some, after touching the water, touch their lips as a sign of let my life and my words be holy. Uh, It's a matter of of what you feel you want to to do with that. But you're going to be invited at the as we come to the close of the service, to remember your baptism and to come and to dip your fingers in the water as a sign to remember that. Remember your baptism. Maybe there's something very special about that because uh, our baptism is a special thing. It's a sign. It's an act that symbolizes our initiation into the body of Christ. It's a a symbol of God's reaching out and making us a part of the family, of God extending grace to us and our responding to it. 
uh, our, our ability to be able to say yes and say uh, thank you for, for grace that's given to us. Maybe, I mean, in our tradition, the, the United Methodist Church, we practice infant baptism. So maybe you were baptized as a child before you have any memory of it. Uh, maybe you were baptized a few years on and, and you have a faint memory of it. I suspect even if you were baptized uh, when you were just a child, um, you probably have been uh, shown maybe somewhat humiliating uh, pictures of wearing a baptismal gown or something like that that, uh, that your parents might have taken. Uh, they might have told you about the day in which you were baptized. Uh, I, I bet you many of you could tell uh, interesting stories about what your parents have told you about your baptism and to remember that. Even if you can't have any physical memory of that occasion, it's important to Remember that we were baptized uh, by, brought to church by people who loved us and cared for us before we could ever love or care for them. We were just dependent and needy upon their grace, uh, upon people who provided for us and, and, and did all the things that were needed, including bringing us to be a part of the church and us being baptized into the life of the, the congregation. As a, as a father, I remember so clearly whenever our two children were baptized. And, um, and on those days in the worship of the congregation that we were serving. And uh, some of the, I mean, they were just important moments. And, um, and holding each of them. Uh, now they're so big and grown, you just can't hardly imagine. You know, you could still, you could ever hold them in your arms. Um, I, for me... And I know I've probably told you this before, but when I was baptized, um, it was my parents, whenever I was a, a, a child, uh, my dad was in the service and we were in Anchorage and um, really didn't get connected into a church. We attended a little bit there, as I understand from my parents, but it wasn't until after he got out and, and we moved back to, to Oklahoma um, myself, my mother, my father. Um, we had made, a, made that move back soon after my brother, Billy, was born. And um, before he was born, we had started attending a church and got involved in the life of that congregation. So when he was born, uh, and it came time for him to be baptized, I was baptized as well. I have just the faintest memory. Just, I mean, what I remember is our family standing, being together at the altar. And uh, my father kneeling, him being baptized. I was kneeling beside him and being baptized. My mother holding my brother and, and his being baptized. I remember that, um, just the vaguest sense in, in my thought. For years, I, I felt kind of cheated. Um, I don't know if you have ever felt this way, if you were baptized as an infant. Um, I had a friend who... Uh, had lived a pretty rough life. He had lived pretty far outside of God's grace in his life and um, didn't grow up in church. And then he had a pretty dramatic experience of coming to Christ. And when he did, uh, at, at 18 years old, um, he was baptized. And he understood it. He knew what it was about. It was an experience in which he made that commitment in his life and faith. That's what we refer to as believer's baptism. Uh, I felt a bit robbed at first that I didn't have that experience, that I didn't have the experience of, of having been far away and then a dramatic experience of God's grace in my life to bring me back and an um, ability to commit to that. By that point, I had already, I, I'd grown up so much a part of the life of the church, of knowing God's presence with me, at probably at the age where I probably would have normally made that kind of decision if I hadn't been a part of the church. I was making the decision to go into ministry at 14 years old. I felt God's call to, uh, to be a pastor. And so that was the, the kind of commitment that I was making. And, and I, I, I remember talking to a friend of mine who was a pastor, 
He was not the pastor at my church, but I'd gotten to know him through camp. He was actually the pastor who officiated at Angie and I's uh, wedding, uh, Mike DeMoss. And, and I, I remember telling Mike, uh, I said, you know, I, um, since I felt this call to ministry, I felt like I needed to be rebaptized. And uh, I remember him talking to me. And, uh, and he taught me something that was so important to understand. Uh, he said, Scott, uh, when you were baptized as a, as a child, God made a commitment to you. God made a claim upon your life. And while at three, four years old, you couldn't understand that, and you couldn't make that commitment to God, you had the opportunity then, as you get, went through confirmation, to reaffirm that. But even now, today, you can make a decision to recommit yourself uh, in light of the baptism that took place in your life. As someone else said to me years later, um, when God is acting in baptism and God claims us, God's promise never goes bad. God's commitment to us never goes bad. So there's not a reason to be rebaptized, But there's plenty of reason to remember your baptism and to recommit yourself in life and, and, and in the, the call of, of Jesus. I didn't have to do it then, uh, once I knew that it was available. Once I knew there was an option for being able to recommit myself in faith, uh, that, that seemed to feel like enough. Uh, since then, I've been a part of many services where, uh, like today, I've asked to, to renew that commitment and asked to remember my baptism and to be thankful for it. And I think there's so many good reasons to. Martin Luther, who started the Reformation, started the Protestant movement, I don't think he ever thought that what he did 500 years ago would lead to such a, a dramatic change in the way that, that church took place. But, but uh, Martin Luther, he, he took on the powers of the church in such a way that I imagine must have caused him much fear and trepidation. It was a courageous thing to do, um, to, to be at such uh, maybe outs with the power of the church, and, uh, and yet he took that on. He had many sleepless nights. Um, one of the things he said is that he often took great comfort in remembering that he was baptized, that he was baptized and claimed by God, that he was Jesus's, and that that gave him a sense of strength and assurance, even in those times of difficulty. We, uh, whether it be our experience that we were, were baptized when we were children and raised in a life with the church and in a life with Christ and God, um, or that we came to baptism later, it's always good to remember it and to understand in some mysterious way God has claimed us and holds us in our lives. We practice baptism in lots of different ways. Mostly in the Methodist tradition, we do sprinkling, in which we sprinkle water on someone's head. Uh, the last church I served had a baptistry, and, uh, and so it was up behind the choir, and uh, whenever someone wanted to be baptized, they could be baptized by sprinkling or by immersion. Um, we had people who chose both of those ways. That's really about the, I mean, there are other times I've individually somebody wanted to be immersed and we would borrow another church for the service. But mostly it was there that I learned to be able to dunk somebody and, and to get them back up. Uh, I, I remember there was a fella, he had, again, another guy who had lived a pretty rough life. Uh, he had gotten married, had moved from town to town, he had moved to Prague. And he and his wife started coming to the church. And um, he came to a place of faith where he understood God's grace in his life through Jesus. And he wanted to be baptized. Thing is, he was 6'6 and probably 320 pounds. Big guy. And so uh, I told him, I said, you know, when, we, when I, I dunk you, I'm going to need you to help stand back up, Okay. And uh, 
Because, you know, somebody that big is going to you know, take a little bit of work. And, and, you know, there's a whole system to learn to that where you put on waders and you go in. And uh, so that way you can, you know, keep basically dry. And um, so, you know, we go and I, I start taking him down. And he does the one thing you can't do, and that is let your feet come up. <laughs> And so there's no leverage for him to be able to, to get himself back up, you know. And I'm like, straight, and come on, come on. And finally, he puts his feet down, and we get him back up. And some of the waters kind of slip down in the waders, you know, and down in the leg of the, uh, and, you know, you, but, you know, he's baptized, and he's now God's child, and, and you get through it, and you kind of laugh about it. And, but it's, the amazing thing is, is how God's grace works in that. Um, maybe some of you even, you know, visited a church where you heard a hellfire damnation sermon and it about scared you to death and so you went up to be baptized. Whatever the way might be, whether it's something you can remember happening or your parents have told you the legacy, there's a, a beautiful gift to that, that even before you could ever understand it, God was already claiming you and holding you in your, your life, and, and that's something good to know. In fact, a friend of mine, when I told him years later, I was, you know, there's something about, I wish I had a dramatic conversion story to tell. He said to me, you know, if you'd lived the first half of the life I had, um, you, you wouldn't wish that. You, you'd be really thankful to, to know that you had a loving father in, in God and, and an advocate in Christ Jesus in your life all those years. He said, I would trade you in a heartbeat um, to have had that experience all through my life. Um, There's beauty in in however it might take place. Um, It's kind of like a a wedding, you know. uh, However it takes place, whatever happens, whatever mishaps go along the way, there's joy and there's celebration and there's the wedding that takes place, and ultimately the couple is married and they're off, and that's been done, and and it's a beautiful thing. Um, But, you know, you can always look back and like, oh, I wish we'd have done this differently at our wedding or whatever it might be. We just embrace the moment that God's given to us, and we hold it, and we move forward with it. It's what God uh, desires for us. If you ask children about water, Uh, What's water for? They have two answers immediately. Um, One is to wash. It's to wash so that we can be cleansed of all that would make us unclean. And the second is to drink, to quench the thirst in our life. Um, We are fallen. We have messed up and we have gotten dirty along the way. And we need to remember that Christ cleanses us. And through our baptism, we are cleansed and set free. And when we remember our baptism, it's like we can allow ourselves to, to just be quick washed, you know, uh, just set right again, remembering that. And that God creates us with a natural desire to seek him. We are designed to thirst for God in our lives. And he is the one who quenches that thirst. Those simple things that even children understand are true in the place of water in our lives. And so we today remember that we have been washed, we have been made clean, and that we come to be cleansed again. Um, Isaac Besheva's singer, I always mess up his middle name, Uh, Nobel Prize winner in literature. He said, uh, I only pray when I'm in trouble. Problem is, I'm in trouble all the time. (laughs) We know that we need to be washed clean. We've always kind of messed up somewhere along the way. We only pray when we're in trouble, and we're in trouble all the time. We're in need of being washed and made clean and made whole. 
I kind of, you know, anxious about us doing the, the baptism renewal and remembrance because I wonder how are you going to feel about that? Are you going to feel a little intimidated by coming up to do that? Are you going to feel uncomfortable about it? You think, oh, that's one of these crazy things Scott's doing again, you know. Um, I think, think about those kind of things and, you know, about half talk myself out of doing something like that. Think about, oh, well, by the time we finish the sermon and we get to actually doing it, well, they've forgotten why we're doing it at the, at the close of the service. Or, you know, that when we come forward, we'll do it like when we come for communion, uh, that as you, you come forward and you form the line as you, as you walk forward, um, will you feel like you're spending too much time standing in line? It's interesting to think about um, we, we, we spend a lot of time in lines, don't we? Go to the grocery store, go to Walmart, and, you know, it seems to take forever no matter what line you pick, and it's always the wrong one, it seems like, because uh, somebody's going to have something that didn't get the right sticker put on it. And, um, and then, you know, you get up there. Uh, you're going to take a, a few minutes to stand in line today as you, as you come. Martin Sheen uh, kind of famous for playing the president in West Wing. Uh, it was in Apocalypse Now before that. Some of you may think of that image. Um, deep person of faith, Roman Catholic. Uh, one of the things that he said about, uh, about his faith was it was just so profound about standing in, in line um, that I wanted to share with you. I wrote it down. This was in a, an interview. It was on NPR. He said, uh, how can we understand the great mysteries of the church? I don't have a clue. I just stand in line and I say, here I am. I am with them, the community of faith. This explains the mystery. It is all love. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed just watching the people in the line. It's the most profound thing to just surrender yourself to the moment. So as you stand in line, I pray that you'll have a sense of mystery, that you'll uh, have a, a sense of, as we, we approach this, we don't understand the full meaning of baptism, but we understand that symbolically it stands for God's grace poured out to us in abundance and for our welcome and receiving of it. So as you come forward, have the mystery of the experience be one of thinking of the others that you have tied your life with in this community of faith and that God extends such grace lavishly upon you. Amen. If you will please stand and join me in singing our hymn of response, O Worship the King.
God indeed has graced and blessed us in our lives. Uh, we have received bountifully from God. And so as we have this moment to share in the offering, we remember that all that we've received is a gift to us from God and that what we offer now is a sign, a symbol of our lives given back to God. Let these gifts uh, be a, a way to, to let your life be dedicated to Christ's service. Let us now prepare ourselves for the morning offering.
If you would, please remain standing as as we declare our faith this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We'll join together in the prayer of thanksgiving over the the water as we uh, prepare ourselves for the the service of of renewal of our our baptismal covenant. I invite you that as we come to the time uh, to to come forward, to do just as you do with communion, to fall into line into two rows and we'll uh, join in coming forward. And uh, Steve and I will be here to greet you. Uh, If you'll just take your fingers and dip into the water and then touch your forehead in however way that you might like to make the sign, the sign of the cross or just to feel the coolness of the water uh, and to remember your baptism. Let us join together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through the water. And after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led led them to freedom through the sea. And their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you had promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth and tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make uh, disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin and to clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. Praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. I invite you to come forward. Um, Again, this is not uh, baptism. It's not uh, re-baptism, but it's a remembrance of your baptism. So remember the claim that God has made upon your life If there's anyone here who hasn't been baptized and you would seek to to be baptized, when you come forward, please share that with Steve or I, and uh, we would be glad to, uh, to, to share the sacrament of baptism with you this morning. Invite you to come as you're ready.
you will please stand and join me in singing our song of sending forth, Come As You Are.
save. 